So if you just joined us, we're doing an AS recap of aldehydes and ketones as part of the, uh, the next chapter in A-level chemistry, which is chapter 26, um, chemistry around the carbonyl compounds. So we're starting with aldehydes and ketones today. And there's a new mechanism later, so uh, prepare yourselves. Want to say so? So another couple of minutes then, folks, and uh, we'll start going through the answers. Right then, folks, um, I've numbered, numbered the first question uh, in subnumbers like one, two, three, four. So there's four molecules there. If you know the name of any of them or really confident with that, all right, just type it into the chat now and we'll see what we come up with. So if you know the answer to one, two, three, or four, just put down the number and what you think it's called. Uh, and then we'll have a look at uh, whether or not we can come up with a perfect mask scheme for this. OK, so just type in any answers. All right. Don't be afraid if you get it wrong. All right. It just lets me know. Where, um, whether or not your thinking is on the, along the right lines. All right, and obviously Cetal's in the in the chat to obviously help out. Okay, Ooh, we've got a few already. So number one, three chloropropanal. Let's have a look. So three carbons, that's carbon one, two, three. There's a chlorine on the third one. So yep, yeah, that's perfect, very well done. Okay. And another one we've got 444-triiodobutantuone. Right, now this is gonna take someone picking. So it's one, two, three, it's definitely four carbons and there's a, key, it's a 
butan ohm or butan 2 ohm because the ketone's in the middle. So, and then that becomes carbon one, two, three, four. So there are three iodines on the fourth carbon tri iodo butan two ohm. Yeah, which is actually spot on. Uh, you don't actually need to put the two, I'm gonna put that in brackets there, if you just simply said 444 triiodobutanone, because the ketone group, the double bonded oxygen can either go there or there, uh, i.e. in the middle of the molecule. And if it was to go onto that carbon there, you'd start numbering from that end. So again, it can't be anything else other than that. But if you did leave the two in, you wouldn't get penalized for that. Three is a tricky one. Did anyone get three? Does anyone remember the rules for naming multiple ketone groups? No joy. Well, I already say it's a ketone because the carbonyl groups are in the middle of the molecule. If they're at the end, it'd be an aldehyde. Um, so how we go about naming this? Well, it's one, two, three, four, five. It's pentan. All right. So it's pentan. But remember this golden rule, all right, which someone has got very, very close with there. I love that answer. Um, if there are multiple ketone groups, yeah, you don't say pentan, all right? It's pentane. So if there were two, it'd be pentane two three dione or pentane three um, two four dione. But because there's three of them, it's pentane two three four. And because there's three of them, you need a prefix tri own. Yeah. Um, technically, again, with this one, I mean, if I just said this pentane trione, if I to take all the numbers out, could it be anything else? All right. Well, there's only three carbons actually in the middle of the molecule. So if there's three ketone groups, there's only three places they can go. So it must be pentane trione. But again, if you put pentane two, three, four trione, uh, as, as all of you have done there, which is brilliant, then that is also fine. And this last one always gets um, uh, always catches students out, actually, uh, in terms of what does it actually look like. Well, if you do get stuck, just draw it out, you know, just sketch what you think it looks like. So you've got an aldehyde group at the end because it's got CHO, and then it's bonded to a carbon, and then that carbon's got three methyl groups on it. So I'm just going to put one, two, three. And then once it's sort of sketched out like that, you've got a better chance of being able to to get it correct, all right? Uh, so, it's a ketone and there's three carbons look in a row. So it's prop anal, yeah? And there are two methyl groups, both on the second carbon. So that would become two, two, dimethyl, prop anal. But again, do I need the numbers here? If I were to get rid of those two numbers and just call it dimethylpropanal, could the molecule be anything else? Well, let's try and sketch out. So if it's dimethyl, if you gave me that name, dimethylpropanal, propanal is that. And there are two methyl groups. Well, they can either go there or there. But again, remember, if you were to put a methyl group on the last carbon in a chain, you've actually lengthened the main chain, so it becomes butanal. So there's only one place those methyl groups can go. So if you did put the numbers in, 2,2-dimethylpropanal, well done. Um, if you didn't use those numbers, just put dimethylpropanal. Again, well done. Right then, three chemical tests for distinction between aldehydes and ketones. So type in a test and an observation, all right? And we'll see what we come up with. A 
any test to distinguish between an aldehyde and ketone. I'm going to make a prediction and say that the vast majority of you, probably 90% plus, put down Tollens reagent in your first row. Yeah, I'm guessing that most of you put Tollens reagent in your first row. And for an aldehyde, you get a silver mirror. A silver mirror or silver mirror effect is a precipitate of silver that's formed. Um, and for the ketone, you get no visible change. Again, I'm using the shorthand here, but in an exam, if you're going to use NBC, make sure you leave a key somewhere. All right, NBC, no visible change. I'm guessing again that most of you in your second row have probably put Failings solution. Or Benedict's reagent, all right, if you do biology, uh, but failing solution uh, is equally acceptable. And you'd have got a brick red precipitate. Okay. Examiners uh, mark scheme say PPT is allowed for precipitate, so you can use that shorthand there. Brick red precipitate, and in a ketone, again, no visible change. And the final one, well, actually, there's a few you can choose from here, all right, but I'm going to suggest that most of you, um, if you know what's why aldehydes are actually producing a positive result and ketones aren't, it's because aldehydes can be further oxidized, or well, can be oxidized. So these are just very mild oxidizing agents. But again, you don't have to use a mild one. You could potentially use an aggressive one like acidified potassium dichromate. So I'm going to write the words in. Yeah, I said I'm testing dichromate, but a lot of year uh, 13s like to use the shorthand for that, so that's usually formula. But again, only use the chemical formulae if you are 100% convinced you know what it is. So a silver potassium dichromate is K2Cr2O7 slash H plus, all right? If you're unsure of that, just go ahead and use the words acidified potassium dichromate. And what would the observation be? Uh, it'd go from a lovely orange color, because this remember we did this in the required practical, when we did the partial oxidation of ethanol to ethanol, which we're gonna look at in a moment. And it goes from orange to green, all right? And the ketone again, no visible change, okay? If, you get, if there is a colour change, all right, top tip, particularly in year 13, because there's quite a lot of colour changes, um, don't just put it turns green, all right? Give a starting colour and ideally a solution, uh, sorry, uh, ideally a state. So an orange solution became a green solution, all right? If you simply said it turned green, all right, well, that's probably not got the accuracy that's needed. So again, uh, other ones you could have used, you could have used acidified potassium manganate, which you may have come across, um, but you definitely will come across uh, in year 13. It's a lovely deep purple color uh, and it will turn to colorless or faint pink. But again, you'll appreciate more of that when we do the transition metals work. Okay, so we've looked at the chemical test and this last bit is gonna take a bit of unpicking. So I said to write an equation for the formation of ethanol from ethanol. So ethanol, Is that again be careful all right do not use structural formula uh, sorry do not use molecular formula in equations if you know the structure of the molecule um, and it's going to become ethanol which is ch3 cho and you guys know this already all right it is an oxidation reaction all right how can we tell it's an oxidation reaction just by looking at our reactants and then our products. Well, what's happening to the ethanol to become ethanol? All right. Well, 
we know oxidation. There are three definitions of oxidation. Oil rig, so oxidation is loss of electrons. So it's loss of electrons. It could also be addition of oxygen. If you add oxygen to something, uh, you are oxidizing it. And there's one more, which is the removal of hydrogen. So is this an oxidation reaction, all right? Using any of these three sort of definitions? Well, hopefully you can see, all right, there are six hydrogens on the left and there are only four in the molecule on the right, okay? Um, so it is an oxidation reaction. So I'm gonna use an oxidizing agent here again, remember, we can use the cheats way here. I'm just putting an O in square brackets to represent our oxidizing agent. So what's gonna happen here? I'm losing two hydrogens from here using an oxidizing agent. And remember, just treat that as an oxygen atom when balancing these equations. So that's gonna take away two hydrogens. So if you come up with, there must be a byproduct of something which contains two hydrogens and one oxygen, okay? So you end up with H2. Oh, all right, and I think that will be balanced. Yep, so that is a balanced equation already. But again, essential conditions. Uh, have a look, Cetal's actually made, again, made a cracking point there. If you write the words acidified potassium dichromate for the oxidizing agent, right, but it's spelt wrong, that's fine. But if you were to put the formula, K, you know, K2Cr2O7 slash H plus, and there was a mis tiny mistake in it, you won't get the mark. All right, so only use the formulae if you are absolutely 100% sure. And by the end of year 13, most students will because they've been exposed to it um, so many times and throughout the course. So essential conditions then. All right, we're using an oxidizing agent, so let's use acidified potassium dichromate. So K2Cr2O7 slash H plus. Um, and because we want to prevent further oxidation, the key thing is here, we need to distill the product. So we're not refluxing. If we're refluxing, we'd go all the way to a carboxylic acid, all right? So you need to heat it up and distill the product um, using uh, distillation apparatus. So a condenser on its side, uh, like so. So before we move on, all right, so let's just see what would happen if we were to reflux it. So we go all the way from, now this is where students again make classic mistakes with the equations. So there's our ethanol, we're gonna oxidize it. This time we're gonna reflux. So then basically as soon as this is formed, it's going to go up the condenser, condense and fall back down into the uh, oxidizing mixture and go all the way to a carboxylic acid. All right. And again, balancing this equation, right? Remember, it is a chemical equation, it must be balanced. Whatever atoms are on the left must be on the right. So what's happened again? Uh, well, two things are happening to our product now. We're still losing, because the six hydrogens there, uh, so to our reaction, sorry, there's six hydrogens there and there's four there. So we're losing hydrogens using oxygen. So we're definitely gonna get water produced, yeah? And then people forget to balance the oxygens now. So you can clearly see there are one, two oxygens on the left and one, two, three oxygens on the right. So you'll need a big two there. Another question they ask about this uh, is observations. So what would the observation be if you're using acidified potassium dichromate? It would turn from orange to green. And before we move on to looking at this, uh, to looking at the reverse processes, so reduction of aldehydes back to alcohols, let's do a bit of inorganic chemistry. All right, so, we know that this is an oxidizing agent, all right? So oxidizing agents get reduced, all right? Oxidizing agents get reduced. So they're going to gain electrons. So what I want you to do is, the dichromate ion is Cr2, O7, 2 minus, and it will become chromium three plus. What I'd like to have a go at, all right? Just take a minute to have a go, is to Oh, hey, this half equation, yeah? So to make this a half equation and make it a balanced half equation, okay? Do you remember the oh, hey rule? 
and again, it doesn't matter if you get this wrong because it's been a while since you've, uh, we've done this. Um, but again, it comes up again as a massive topic on redox uh, equilibria in year 13. So, applying the Bohe rule, technically, B, balance all the atoms which are not oxygen and hydrogen. So that means I'm going to need a two there. Um, add H2O to balance the oxygens. All right. So I've got seven oxygens on the left. I've got none on the right. So I'm going to need seven H2Os. Okay, and the final bit, oh, sorry, the last two bits, add H pluses to balance the hydrogens. So we've got no hydrogens on the left. We've got 14 on the right, two times seven. So I'm gonna add 14 H plus to here. And now add electrons to balance the charges. So what's the total charge on the left-hand side? And again, there's a classic mistake that I'll point out in a moment. 14 plus there, two minus there. So it is 12 plus or plus 12 on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, there are two lots of three plus, so that's six plus, okay? And again, going back to one of the earlier videos that I made on uh, balancing half equations, whenever you get to this stage, you add electrons to the more positive side, yeah? Because that'll bring the number down because electrons are negatively charged. So I'm gonna add six electrons to this side. And then it is, a balanced half equation. And you can clearly see that the potassium dichromate is an oxidizing agent because the dichromate ion is gaining electrons. It is getting reduced. All right. Okay, okay. So let's look at the reverse process then. So we know that we can oxidize our, our uh, primary alcohols to uh, aldehydes and we can oxidize secondary alcohols to ketones. But we can then reduce them back to their original alcohols. And that's what we're gonna have a look at now. So, let's have a look. So we use a ketone as an example, so. So let's take uh, a secondary alcohol, propantuol, and oxidize it to propanone. And again, I think, just looking at it, it is definitely balanced. So we've got propan 2-ol being oxidized to propan O. All right, it's an oxidation process, and we use O as being, um, uh, in square brackets as being an oxidizing agent. But let's go in the reverse direction. So if we want to go backwards, all right, to the alcohol, right, how would we go about doing it? Well, again, chemically, what's happening here, all right, we've got uh, C3H6O on the left, and on the right, we've got C3H8O. So again, you can use molecular formula, right, just to see what's going on between the two uh, sides of the, of the chemical equation. And hopefully you can see the six hydrogens on the left and two extra ones on the right. So this thing is gaining hydrogens. So when you're writing reduction equations, right, so this top one's an oxidation, you use O in square brackets to represent your oxidizing agent. When you're writing reduction equations, you use an H in square brackets. So a H in square brackets is a reducing agent. Uh, an H in square brackets is a reducing agent. But again, 
it's not balanced, all right? Because we've, you've already identified that you need to go from six hydrogens to eight hydrogens. So again, make sure it's balanced like so. And there's quite a few examples to have go at in work that's been set for you this week, all right? Uh, and it usually, it'll be the same each time. So uh, it'll be, if it's an aldehyde, it'll still be two hydrogens, should be anyway. Let's try one, let's try uh, ethanol. And just check aldehyde, primary alcohol. What are we going to use? A reducing agent. How many do we need? Well, this is C2H4O, and this is C2H6O. So we're going to need two lots. Where you might need more than two is if it was a dione or trione, so there'd be multiple ketone groups to reduce, uh, or there was a dial, all right? So if it was a, a, an aldehyde, uh, a, a molecule with two aldehyde groups at either end, okay? All right, so you'd have a slightly more than that. So if we were to, let's do an example. Yeah, why not? So let's do... Cho CH2 Cho, or technically, if you're going to be more accurate, that would be fine, but OHC CH2 Cho. So you've got an aldehyde group uh, at either end of the molecule. Okay, so this would be called three carbons propane dial. And we can reduce this. So I'm going to use H's. Back to, so we're just going to basically turn the aldehyde groups into primary alcohol groups. So, it becomes propane 1,3-diol, all right? And this time, ugh, balancing the H's, Effectively, you need two H's per aldehyde group. So you could just use that as a rule if you wanted to and then put a big four there, all right? That would balance it. Or you could use molecular formula again. So that's C3H4O2. And this is C3H8O2. So what's changing between the two molecular formulas? Four hydrogens on the left, eight hydrogens on the right, so I'm going to need an extra four, okay? Now, what is the reducing agent of choice, all right? So what reducing agents out there do we know? But you might, you might, you probably haven't come across many. I mean, technically, you could say if, if, if a reducing agent is supplying hydrogen, then hydrogen is a reducing agent, which it is, all right? Particularly if you use a nickel catalyst. So you, you might have, when we did um, alkenes to alkanes, you'd use hydrogen gas with a nickel catalyst. All right, and you are adding hydrogen to the alkene to become an alkane. You are therefore reducing the alkene to an alkane. But in this particular example, you have to use the following uh, reducing agent. And this is one where the formula is a lot easier than the name, all right? And it is NaBH4 or Nabaha 4, as we call it uh, at our school. Nabaha 4, Nabaha 4. Um, and the name is sodium tetrahydrido borate 3, which is the oxidation state of the boron in this molecule. Um, so again, you could go and just learn that name, or I think this is one of those examples where the formula is probably easier to learn, all right, Nabaha 4. So Nabaha 4 is our reducing agent. Okay, beautiful. And fortunately for you, there is a mechanism for this process, 
Okay, so there is a mechanism for turning aldehydes and ketones back into primary alcohols and secondary alcohols. And you use NABA 4 Okay, so let's look at how what that mechanism might actually look like. So we'll use this here as an example, the ethanol to ethanol. Okay, right. So the key thing to know about Nabaha 4 is, is that it is a source of H minus. And H minus is the hydride ion. I mean, technically, it is um, it's the borohydride ion, but it does sort of dissociate uh, into the hydride ions. Um, but you can just get away with calling it H minus. So it's a hydrogen with a negative charge. So what must have happened to it? It must have gained an electron, which means this thing does have a lone pair. Okay, so. Let's try and figure out what's going on here. So I'm going to draw out my aldehyde. And I know it's using H minus, which comes from the Nabaha 4. And I know I'm going to end up making eth uh, ethanol. And again, contemplating what's going on here is a lot easier if you know something about the carbonyl group. It is a polar bond. Why is it polar? Uh, because the oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon. So the electrons in the carbon-oxygen double bond are shifted towards the oxygen, uh, because oxygen has the greater pulling power, um, which we call electronegativity. So now, hopefully, once you've got them in, you can see there's going to be an attraction taking place. Yeah, and there is. There'll be a curly arrow from this lone pair on the hydrogen, hydride ion, sorry, to the carbon. Yeah, and then the seed will on. What that'll do is you'll end up with, if, if, if that was to just stay as it is, you're going to end up with a one, two, three, four, five, a carbon with five bonds on it, which obviously is, is not a favorable arrangement. So what will happen is one of, these, one of the pairs of electrons in the double bond will break and go all the way to the oxygen because they've already shifted that way. Don't forget, the oxygen is more electronegative, so the electrons in that bond are shifted towards the oxygen atom. So what will that form then? Well, I've still got my CH3. All right, still got my H. I'm adding this H beneath. And then because I've broken the double bond, there'll be a single bonded oxygen. But there's more to it than that, because technically that oxygen has gained an electron. Remember, when this double bond was formed, they shared two pairs of electrons. And what's happened is, is the oxygen has taken, effectively taken one of those electrons, with uh, a pair of those electrons, uh, one of which was its own, one of which came from the carbon. So it has gained an electron. So it becomes negatively charged. There's no specific name for this intermediate. Uh, you could just call it an oxoanion, all right, which is oxygen negatively charged. And then let's have a look. We're not quite finished yet because this does not look like that, which is our final product. So what we need is, right, another hydrogen to bond there. And we, we get it in the form of H plus this time. So we're using H minus over here, and we're using H plus over here. Where does that H plus come from though, I hear some of you ask? Well, it actually comes from the solvent, right? And this is in the textbook as well. It comes from the solvent that the Nabaha 4 is dissolved in. So what would you have this dissolved in? A, a, um, a typical solvent that you could use, you could use water, right? Which I think is the easiest and safest thing to do. So aqueous Nabaha 4, right? It's got extra hydrogens in it because of water. Um, and then you can see there'll be a nice simple, again, be careful, don't make this arrow straight, make it nice and curved. That lone pair will attract the hydrogen, uh, the H plus from solvent, and form 
our product. All right. And that's it. It's a nice, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward mechanism. Uh, can we deduce the name of it? Well, let's look at the initial attack. So what we've we got here, something with a lone pair donating or attacking the carbon. So a lone pair donor is a nucleophile. So it's nucleophilic. Nucleophilic. And then what type of reaction is it? Well, have a look here. We've got three reactants on the left, one there and two there, and only one product. So those three are adding together to make one product. So it's an addition reaction. So it's nucleophilic addition. So this is the next mechanism in your arsenal of a-level chemistry mechanisms, okay? All right, so what I'm gonna do now then is, all right, I'm going to do an example, well, I'm gonna write an example for a ketone and I want you to draw the mechanism, okay? So I'll leave that there as an example. So this time, let's do CH3, we use Butantuan. So there's the reduction of butantuone or butanone to butantuol. Could you outline the mechanism for that, please? All right. So if you're watching this later, you can just fast forward the video when you're ready. I'll give you two minutes for that. Right then, I'm just gonna get rid of this so I can set up the answer. Okay, so again, no credit really for putting, well, no credit at all for putting partial charges in. Um, but beware, if you do put partial charges in, make sure you get them the right way around. Um, so if you put that as delta positive and that as delta negative, you will penalise. If you don't have them at all, you won't get penalised. So just be careful with that. Attack the carbon, cedar one bone breaks, and then forms this intermediate. And then how are we going to stabilize this anion to make our product? Well, the O needs to gain a hydrogen ion from somewhere, and it comes from the solvent. Okay. And there you go. Okay. So it's as uh, simple as that. Well, it's one of the nicer mechanisms, I think, uh, for nuclear addition. And the good news is there's only two um, 
nuclear files you have to be able to do this uh, with. One is NABA4, so you're using H- as your nuclear file, and the other one is using hydrogen cyanide, which we're going to move on to now, uh, which is sort of the final part of the work that I've set for you this week. All right? Um, Okie dokie. So I'm going to erase all of this now. And then we'll put nucleophilic addition of HCN. Okay. Right. So we're going to try this with, so the key thing to know about hydrogen cyanide, all right, is it contains H plus and CN minus. Okay, so we're using hydrogen cyanide, not potassium cyanide. You use potassium cyanide in aqueous ethanol for nucleophilic substitution. For nucleophilic addition, you use hydrogen cyanide. Um, so we're going to use ethanol for this one. Ooh. All right, and hopefully, and I'm not going to show you this, I'm going to let you guys figure this out, all right, um, uh, for the first example. Hopefully you guys know it's nucleophilic addition. Which of these two things is going to be the nucleophile? Well, a nucleophile is a lone paired donor. So, yeah. Just before you start, quick recap on how to actually show the cyanide ion. I always show the carbon nitrogen triple bond uh, with a negative charge on the carbon for accuracy. But if you were to use CN minus, or or that one, it doesn't matter as long as the key thing is the lone pair is on the carbon. The nitrogen still has a lone pair, but the one that's actually going to be donated is the one on the carbon. So you can have them in, in any sort of guise that you want there. Okay, so I'm going to use that one. So I'm not going to put partial charges in this time. Could you have a go at outlining the mechanism? Have a go, all right? Uh, and if you really fancy it, as in give it a go, try and name the product, yeah? So I want you to have a go at this mechanism. It's nuclear addition, so it's similar, all right, to the last example using uh, a Navajo 4, and then name the product, all right? And I'll give you a couple of minutes for that. Okay then, so let's give it a go. Same thing as before, the cyanide ion with its lone pair on the carbon, negatively charged will attack the carbon on the carbon aisle, the cedar rondo bond will break and form a single bond. And then the second stage, we get the H plus. Again, we get it from the solvent. Which solvent do we use this time? Though 
Um, we actually use an acid, so just they don't really ask for that um, in this, um, but we use an acid as the solvent. So the, the hydrogen cyanide is uh, in some sort of acid, sulfuric acid, for example. Uh, so again, but again, all you need to show is the H plus. You don't even have to write the words from solvent because you know, that's irrelevant to the mechanism. And then we form this product. Now, has anyone had a go at naming that? Right. I told you a couple of weeks ago that uh, we'd be exposed to new sort of functional groups as we go through the course. Uh, so if you can remember how to name it, great. If you can't, don't worry. You will after this. Okay. Well, it's tricky because you can either name it as a nitrile or you can name it as an alcohol. Well, base, if you look back at the notes uh, that you were given a couple of weeks ago, you can clearly see um, that if it's a case between these two, then the nitrile gets the priority. So I'm going to name this as a nitrile. So it is, there's my longest carbon chain. So that's three, so it's propane nitrile, not propan, don't forget the E, propane nitrile. And there is an OH group on carbon two. So that's carbon one, that's carbon two, that's carbon three. So it's gonna be two hydroxy, all one word, propane nitrile. All right. So again, and you could have used a ketone, you'd have formed uh, a hydroxypropane, a hydroxy nitrile, uh, there'd have been methyl group in that as well. All right, we'll come on to that in a second. I'll give you another example to have a go at. But rather excitingly, hopefully you can see there's something quite nice about this product, thinking back to last week's work. There is a chiral carbon. So this molecule does exhibit optical isomerism. Yeah. So remind ourselves of how to draw optical isomers. Get your tetrahedral carbons. There's my mirror. And then do the mirror image. That'll do. So, again, start filling all the groups around it. You want OH, a H, a CN, and a CH3. So, OH, CH3, CN, and H. Okay. So, draw the mirror image. So, H through C. And again, those in my class, I was really, really, really impressed with the work you did on this. All right, so your, your drawings for um, enantiomers were spot on. So very well done. I'm sure it was the same for the other two classes as well. So again, keep up the good work with this, guys. Just be aware, C bonded to C, then N. So when you're mirroring that, N, C, all right, uh, to show that it's still carbon-carbon uh, bond. And how would you distinguish between these two? Okay these two enantiomers would rotate plane polarized light in opposite directions. Okay, so this molecule, this 2-hydroxy propane nitrile exhibits optical isomerism. Yeah, so they'll and again, optical isomers are a form of stereoisomers, so they've got the same structural formula, but different arrangement of atoms in space. So how do I know which one I've got? Well, I could measure the rotation of plane polarized light and see whether it's the positive or the negative, all right? So or the, or one that rotates it clockwise or anti-clockwise. But there's something quite interesting about the product 
of this reaction. So this molecule does exhibit optical isomerism. It has to, it's got a chiral carbon, yeah? However, the product of this reaction is optically inactive, all right? So, here. which means that, so the product is optically inactive, which means no effect on plane polarized light. So even though this molecule does exhibit optical isomerism, the product of this reaction, the product of this mechanism does not. So the product, which is this, is optically inactive. Why do you think that is? That's a really tough question, by the way. So even though the molecule the does exhibit optical isomerism, it's got chiral carbon, the product of this reaction does not do that, right? So I could do this in a test tube and then shine plain polarized light through it and it wouldn't be rotated at all, even though it probably should. So what must be happening with this, right? Well, I'm going to use that awful, awful word. All right, I'm just going to get rid of my intermediate here, which I hate saying. Why is it optically inactive? Because you are forming a racemate or racemic mixture. Which, to recap, is a 50 50 mix of enantiomers. So that tells us that, all right? Yes, 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 well done, Tegan. All right, it contains equal amounts of both the anti-clockwise and the clockwise enantiomers, all right? So 50-50 mix of enantiomers. So half of the molecules in this product will be that. Half of the molecules in this product will be that. So 50% will be this one. 50% will be that one, all right? Let's say this one's rotating it clockwise by 10 degrees. This one's rotating it anti-clockwise by 10 degrees. Net effect, there is no effect. There is no effect on plane polarized light. You are forming a racemic mixture. And why is that, all right? And this is pretty cool. So why does this mechanism produce a 50-50 mix, all right, of enantiomers? Well, it's to do with the initial attack. I've showed the cyanide ion here attacking the carbon, all right? But whereabouts would it attack that carbon? So I've got my molly mods out again. And let's try and oh, recreate this. So I've got my ethanol, all right? And there's my carbonyl carbon just there. Here's my hydrogen cyanide. So I'm gonna take off the H plus. And here is my cyanide ion, okay? So let's get my other one as well. Now, because the mechanism I've drawn behind me is in two dimensions, I've shown you that the best way for this cyanide ion to get to the carbon is backside attack, like that. But if you think in three dimensions, there's probably an easier way to get to this carbon because even though you know it's fairly accessible, it's still got to navigate its way between that methyl group and that hydrogen. So it's got to find a way into there. There's an easier way, all right? And if I rotate this, can you see that the actual carbonyl group, all right, this carbon here is not tetrahedral. This methyl group is, you see a tetrahedral carbon just there. But the geometry around this carbon with the carbonyl group on it is actually trigonal planar. So can you see that? One, two, three areas of bonding um, spaced out as far as part, part as possible due to electron repulsion. Uh, so it's trigonal and it's planar, it's flat. So actually this is easier 
to, it's easier to get to the carbon from above or below. And if it comes from above, all right, let's see what happens. All right, so I'm going to just show you that mechanism. Here's my cyanide ion. That's my lone pair on my carbon. They're going to come from above like so and attack that carbon. That bond will break. Oh. So it's come from above and landed on our carbon. And then this lone pair will pick up our hydrogen from the solvent. Superb. And you see, I've got a chiral carbon in the middle, all right, uh, and there's one of my products. If you attack from below, though, so I've got the same setup here, okay? So there's my planar, my planar carbonyl carbon, all right? The first one we attack from above, now I'm going to attack from below the molecule, so now this bond is going to break. Yep, so again, it's going to come from beneath. Bond there. Oh, pick up the hydrogen, and there we have it. And then you can see in our two products, yeah, we've actually got there's our mirror images. Look, okay, so that's if it attacked from above, that's if it attacked from below. We've got non in so non superimposable mirror images. If I hold them like this, okay, and then I try and put one on top of the other, can you see that the oxygens are in slightly different places? All right, so it's a bit like your left hand, right hand, right? Try and put one on top of the other, the thumbs are sticking out. Very easy to see with this one, okay? So it all to do with that initial attack of the nucleophile. So it's a probability question, really. What are the chances of my nucleophile? So I'll go back to the other one. What's the probability of my nucleophile attacking from above the molecule? And then what is the probability of it attacking from beneath the molecule, yeah? Well, it's 50-50. So half of my cyanide ions, half of my nucleophiles are going to attack from above and give me, let's say, the left-hand molecule, the left-handed product, and half of my cyanide ions are going to attack from beneath, thus giving me my right-hand, <laughs> thank you, Cito, my right-hand model, uh, my right-hand molecule. So half of the molecules are going to be rotate plane polarized like left uh, uh, clockwise, and half are going to rotate it anti clockwise. And it's all to do with that initial attack. So, and the probability. So, this initial attack here, all right, and how would you articulate, all right? Why do you get a racemic mixture, all right? So, we'll do the explanation over here because there's 50 50 chance of the cyanide, or you just put the word nucleophile, attacking the C double bond O from above or below. And why is that? Why is that? It's all to do with the geometry of the carbonyl group. So what was the geometry around that carbonyl group? It's not a tetrahedral carbon. It is a planar, trigonal planar carbon. So you can say, uh, because the C double bond O group is planar. Yeah. So the C double bond O group is planar. Therefore, there's a 50-50 chance of the cyanide ion attacking from above or below the plane, which means that half of the molecules are going to be that flavor. Half of the molecules in the product are going to be that flavor. So even though that molecule does exhibit optical isomerism, the product via this mechanism, if you were to make that using this mechanism, your product would be a racemic mixture. All right. And it was the same for the hydride ion as well. So when we looked earlier, there was this equation. OK. All right. Where we did butan 2 ohm. Okay. And you can clearly see that the product has a chiral carbon. There's a carbon there 
with four things attached to it. It's got that bit, the H, the OH, and the CH3. So that product has a chiral carbon, but if that is made via nucleophilic addition, which it was, then because the carbonyl group is planar, the hydride ion in that example had a 50-50 chance of attacking from above the plane or below the plane. So even though that product does have a chiral carbon, it's made by this action, just like this one down here, it's optically inactive. There is zero effect on plane polarized light because you have formed a racemic mixture, which is a 50-50 mix of enantiomers, all right? And hopefully, I've given you enough detail there because I, I don't want to go longer than an hour, and I think we've uh, covered quite a lot there. Um, but if the task 